here on the Unsafe Bible. We're going to be in Amos next week, so if you want to get ahead of me, it's nine chapters, 167 verses. Just saying. We'll probably be there for a while, and you can get a feel for where we're going. For those of you who support us, thank you. We entered the top 100 podcast, Bible podcasts this week at number 98. So I don't, you know, I don't know what, what that means other than that, but if you go to feedspot.com, you can see that. Uh, we're currently on the podcast studying the book of Revelation, and we're doing a podcast every day. So for 25 minutes, you can study the book of Revelation. Uh, keep praying for us as we continue to expand and do what we can do, because our goal is to see the lost saved and the saved become grounded in God's word. So for those of you who choose to watch us on YouTube, and yes, I'm talking to you, thank you. Uh, please click the like button and subscribe, because if you do that, I have learned that that changes things and more people can actually access us. It kind of opens up the funnel a little bit wider. And by the way, we do have an app for those who don't have it yet. Uh, it's at the iTunes Store or at Google Play. It doesn't cost anything. Just search for the Unsafe Bible and download it. And you can get all of the content, about 650 hours worth, and all the notes and the podcast. And it also has a link so that you can get to live streaming whenever we're on. So anyway... And you can use it for small groups, some people are, and you can use it for personal study. So that's my ad for the evening. Let's pray, and then we'll get digging into the book of Joel. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for allowing us to study your word, and we just we really want to know what it is that you have to say to us from your word. Speak to us. Have the Holy Spirit show us exactly what, what it is that you're saying here as we finish up this book. Thank you, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're going back to Armageddon. That's kind of funny when you look at it that way, but that's what we're going to do. Uh, Armageddon is one of those places, one of those uh, events, one of those things that um, you think you've read it once, and every time I study it, I learn something new. So we're going to be looking at it. We're going back to it. So let's review. Where, are we, where have we been so far? We're in the book of Joel. And the theme of the book of, the, of book of Joel is the day of the Lord, which Armageddon is part of. It's just one part of. As we've learned, the day of the Lord is not a single 24-hour day. It's actually a period of time that lasts over 1,000 years. The day of the Lord includes everything that the Lord wants to do from the beginning of the tribulation period through the new heaven and the new earth after the millennium. And then it, that's the end of the day of the Lord. In other words, Revelation 4, 1 through Revelation 22, 7. That's the whole thing. There are a lot of other different views as to what that means, but I agree with what Dr. Pentecost says because that, that's his view and that's my view. And, uh, and what we're here in Joel is we're at the end of the tribulation, which is the first seven years of the day of the Lord. It begins when the church is removed, but we're not at the end of the day of the Lord. And just like the folks in Thessalonica, don't get confused from the terms and the things that we see going on around us today. We are living in the end times, that's true. And what lies ahead, you think everyone would be trembling and trying to figure it out and prepare for it, but most aren't. Have you noticed that? Most people aren't. And because of that, you also can look at that and say, well, that's a fulfillment of prophecy too. So, you know, the next time somebody says, I don't believe what you're saying, okay, great, the Lord said that. And he did. They, as it says in the word, it says, as in the days before the flood, they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. That's in Matthew 24, 38 and 39. That's kind of the way it's going to be. People are oblivious then. And have you noticed that some people are oblivious now? I mean, it, it's pretty common. It's critical for us to understand that the day of the Lord cannot begin until the church is removed, the rapture has to take place, then the day of the Lord can start. I always get a kick out of folks who ask me, who do I think the Antichrist is? And I'm, I'm kind of like, I don't know, and I don't care, uh, because there's going to be a seven-year peace deal, and whoever is the author of that seven-year peace deal, I won't be here to see, because we're out of here. 
But that's when things kick off. And here's the thing. If you think things are weird now, they're going to really go off the hook once we're gone. You haven't seen anything yet. Zephaniah 1.18 says this, Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land will be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he will make speedy riddance of all those who, and here's the phrase, dwell in the land. In other words, earth dwellers, those who have placed their trust in this planet and living here and not trust in the Lord. We learn that during that day, there are numerous things that take place that impact primarily earth dwellers. And some of those are outlined for us here in Joel, and we're going to talk about some of them this evening, but you can also go to Isaiah, Zechariah, Zephaniah, Amos, Ezekiel, Daniel, Obadiah, Malachi, Matthew, Mark, Luke, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 2nd Peter, and Revelation, and by the way, the theme is to remove the usurpers. That's a type that we see in the book of Joshua. So yes, Joshua also talks a little bit about the day of the Lord too. Isn't that interesting? It's all over the Bible. It, it's, it's just there. And that, by the way, that's not an exhaustive list. There's other places that it shows up. We've been examining that time during the day at the end of the tribulation when the nations of the world are being judged. The major event is called Armageddon, but that's not the conclusion. There's still more to come before the day ends. In the chronology of the last days that we've been looking at, we've passed the end of the tribulation, and we went past the battle of Armageddon, but before the beginning of the millennium. And we look, now we're looking back at, the, at Armageddon, but we learn there's a 75-day time period from the end of Armageddon to when the millennium starts. There's not a lot of information on that in the Bible, but we kind of took a look at that and made some educated guesses, if you want to call it that, as to what's going to be happening during that time period. So now we're in, we're in Joel. We're going to read through the first 13 verses. It'll give us kind of a sense. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Then I'll enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my inheritance Israel, whom they've scattered among the nations. And they have divided up my land. They've also cast lots for my people, traded a boy for a prostitute, and sold a girl for wine so that they may drink. Moreover, what are you to me, Tyre, Sidon, and all the regions of Philistia? Are you repaying me with retribution? But if you're showing me retribution swiftly and speedily, I will return your retribution on your head. Since you've taken my silver and my gold, brought my precious treasures to your temples, and sold the sons of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks in order to remove them far from their territory. Behold, I'm going to stir them up from the place where you've sold them and return your retribution on your head. I'll also sell your sons and your daughters into the hands of the sons of Judah, and they'll sell them to the Sabaeans, to a distant nation, for the Lord has spoken." Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for holy war. Stir up the warriors. Have all the soldiers come forward. Have them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. And let the weak man say, I'm a warrior. Hurry and come, all you surrounding nations, and gather yourselves there. Bring down, Lord, your warriors, and let the nations be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come tread the grapes, for the wine press is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. There's a clear contrast here between what we saw in the first part of Joel, which is all about an invasion of locusts, and what we're seeing now where it's people. In the first part, we saw the land laid waste by locusts, and their only hope was Yahweh. That was the only hope they had. Judah recognized that. They repented and were restored. And we've seen that repented na repeated now as well during the day of the Lord in the lead up to the conclusion of the battle of Armageddon. There's another contrast here too, though, where Judah was destroyed by the army of locusts and completely laid waste. This is now where the nations are at the end of the tribulation. They're now finding themselves in the place that Judah found themselves. Judah repented, and they were restored by Yahweh. 
the nations for the past seven years have been invited to do so by 144,000 Jewish evangelists, and they have refused to do so. There have been a lot of people saved, more people saved than at any other time in history, but still, not everybody has responded. So now, arriving at this point, the nations are being personally invited, and they'll be supernaturally drawn to a location that the Bible calls the Valley of Jehoshaphat. We, we think it's the Kidron Valley, but we don't, we don't know for sure. They're going to be deep in rebellion. They're going to show up to fight each other, but then God shows up and they're going to try and fight God. They just don't know that piece yet. They don't know that they're showing up to fight against God. Dramatically, as the forces of the beast turn from fighting the Jews as well as the other armies that show up because there's, there's a problem at the end of the age. Not everybody decides to continue following the beast and they're going to be fighting. They turn when they see Messiah show up and as enemies to fight a common enemy, Jesus Christ, as he shows up in the sky. He and his invasion force suddenly appear in the sky after all these troops have been drawn supernaturally to a single location. And I look at that as let's expedite the judgment of the nations and have everybody in one place. It makes a lot, things a lot simpler. And that's what Jesus is doing here at the end of the age. The stated goal of the beast and his troops was we're going to have one last battle. We're going to deal with those Jews who have been able to stay away from us for the past three and a half years. We're going to kill them all. We're going to kill the enemies of the state. But when God shows up in the person of Jesus Christ, everything changes. The true reason that they've been drawn here to this location is actually they're here for judgment. Zechariah 14, 12 to 13 tells us what that will look like. This will be the nature of the plague with which the Lord will strike all the nations that have fought against Jerusalem. That's everybody sitting in this valley at this point. Their flesh will decay while they stand on their feet, and their eyes will rot away in their sockets, and their tongues will dissolve in their mouths. And on that day, there'll be great confusion from the Lord among them. They'll seize each other and attack one another violently. And may the Lord bless his word. That's, I mean, it, it, it sounds rather dramatic and rather gross, but that's exactly what the Lord's going to do. He's judging these people. As the earth dwellers, the folks who have put their trust, and that's a term that we use also, in the, it shows up in the book of Revelation over and over and over again, those who are earth dwellers. And we saw it already in the Old Testament as well. The one, they, they, these are folks who they trust in whatever the beast's doing, and now they realize who their enemy is, and it's the one who's going to end their rule on this planet. So they turn as one to attack him, and it doesn't end well. Zechariah tells us it doesn't end well. Joel says, in, starting in verse 9, Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for holy war. Stir up the warriors. Have all the soldiers come forward. Have them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears and let the weak man say, I'm a warrior. Hurry and come, all you surrounding nations, and gather yourselves there. Bring down, Lord, your warriors and let the nations be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. What this is is the final in time attack of the kingdoms of this world against the kingdom of our God and his Christ, which we read over and over and over again in the scriptures. And I've got it, the verses listed there for you. The king uses irony in his command to the nations, telling them to show up. He tells the enemy to prepare, to consecrate themselves. He mocks them and their worship of the beast. Remember him? We saw him back in Revelation chapter 3. Well, not yet, not back, but we see him in Revelation 13, 3. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. The whole earth marveled, and they followed the beast. And they worshiped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? He's never called a person. He's always an it, even in the Greek, which tells you there's something going on here genetically that he's no longer quite human. 
the nations of the world are all about to learn the answer to that claim. They're going to find out just exactly who it is who can fight the beast. So God mocks them with his call to come together here in Joel. Now, you remember, Jesus has already won everything. He, he achieved the victory over 2,000 years ago on the cross, and he rose from the dead. He's simply removing those pesky folks who are protesting the victory. These are the usurpers, just like as Joshua entered the land, he was told to remove the Rephaim and the Canaanites and all those who did not want to serve the Lord. That's what's happening here at the end of the age, the same thing. Now, why do I say mocking? You have to go to the Hebrew to find this. The nations have no conception of reality, and they really believe that they're serving their God by serving the beast. It says that in Revelation 13, 4. In Hebrew, the word that we see translated in the English as prepare is the word kadsu. It means to be set apart, to be consecrated or hallowed. They're going to war on behalf of their God against the one who is God. So they're going to have to prepare themselves. They're going to consecrate themselves to Satan. And this is going to require some serious courage building and incredible spiritual blindness. And if you recall, one of the hallmarks of the last days is the use of substances to put people into altered states of consciousness, drugs, alcohol, and you name it, that might be part of how they prepare for battle. The picture being drawn here, though, is one of total and full mobilization. There is no exemption at all. The nations will actually draft the farmers, who normally are exempt, to keep the food supply going. But now they're going to be turning all of their farm implements and tools into weapons. So imagine a... I don't know what they're going to do with all the combines, but they're going to turn them into some kind of armored personnel carrier, I guess. I don't know. They're going to be drafted all the week. Anybody who normally would not be drafted, they're out of, they're out of bodies. They're, anybody and everybody who can carry a weapon is going to. The hour is so critical for the nations that they're all coming to the battlefield and it's all these different groups who normally wouldn't show up for battle, they're all being called in. And remember, the battle is going to be in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, which is the same place that we already talked about that will also be where the sheep and goats judgment will take place. Now, in Isaiah 2 and Micah 4, we see the opposite thing. We read of implements of war turned into agricultural tools during the rule of Jesus Christ, during the millennium. We're used to talking about he's going to take weapons and turn them into plowshares. Well, this is irony, because now he's saying, do the opposite. Now, these folks may not have initially thought that they were going to go to war with God. They thought, it again, this is a final battle, the beast has called us here, we're going to take care of those pesky Christians and those pesky Jews and get rid of them. But what we see, actually, because God intends to turn it into judgment, we're going to see the heart of unsaved man as he turns against his creator in open warfare. All bets are off. Total commitment to the combat operation has been made. All agricultural production worldwide has been halted in order for this to happen. Now, when you see that, you also see... The enemy, who is Satan, what he really thinks of mankind, because he hates us. Now, they worship him. It says that in, th in Revelation 13, 4. They're worshiping the dragon. They're part of this army, and they're being led to slaughter. Those who normally are considered not worthy for combat, of, and they have physical problems, they're going to. And they're not aware of what Jesus said about this guy. He's a thief. His name is Satan. And he has one goal, and he's never changed that goal. It's in John 10.10. 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's it. That's what he's here for. And that's what he's getting ready to do, even at the Battle of Armageddon with those who worship him. He wants them dead because nobody is going to be able to survive because they're going to starve to death. There's no food being produced. 
Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And we'll see that as well. The earth dwellers, in other words, those who are firmly entrenched in the world's system, believe they're going out to find a final battle and achieve final victory for the beast. Their God is Satan. And his false Christ is the beast. We talk about that as we, in the book of Revelation when we studied that. One would think that they would be wise enough to see the insanity of what I just said. But they're not in their right mind. In fact, there are a lot of them who aren't in their right mind even today. The Bible teaches us that they're no longer in their right mind. The further they go away from God, they start seeking after madness. It says that in Deuteronomy 28, 28. We see that today. With some of the decisions that are made and some of the things people say, you know, you, you scratch your head and go, you're crazy. How can you say that? Well, they are. They're completely and totally deluded. They are convinced, the folks who are serving the beast and showing up in this army, they're convinced that once the battle is done, that the dragon will make everything all right. He'll find the food someplace. Jesus, though, warned what the true goal of Satan is back at Matthew 24, 22. He said that unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. There you go. Satan's goal is to kill off mankind, all of us. His one true goal is to kill off all of man. Everybody created in the image of God. A final battle against the Jews and those who have turned against him at the cost of agricultural production, ensuring the starvation of everyone who's left on the planet, helps him achieve that goal. That way there'll be nobody here for Messiah to rescue. That's the goal. And it's all a trap. God's the one calling the shots and bringing all the rebels into one location for judgment. He's taking care of the deal. So we come to verse 11 of chapter 3. Hurry and come, all you surrounding nations, and gather yourselves there. Bring down, Lord, your warriors. Let the nations be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. The Lord tells them, hurry up, bring it. His timetable is to prevent the destruction of all mankind. And he's going to prevent that from occurring. But it does also include judgment of all those rebels and everybody who's aligned with the beast and everybody who's mistreated his people. When Jesus returns, he returns as the avenger of blood. And it's interesting. It says he's going to be seated for this military action. Judges sit. Generals don't, but Jesus has already won the battle. He's the judge, and he's going to be seated when this all takes place. That's what it says. He also calls for his armies to be there. Now, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're going to be part of that army. And that's fun. Now, we do not read of those forces engaging the enemy. We, we read of the armies showing up, but not engaging the enemy. I tend to think that the armies of the Lord are there to prevent anyone who is destined for judgment from getting away. They're kind of guarding the perimeter of the battlefield to make sure that they stay within and they're not being let out. They're guarding the battlefield for the very next action. Isaiah 63, verses 4 to 6 says, For I looked forward to the day of vengeance, and then payback time arrived. I love the way the Net Bible puts that. I looked, and there was no one to help. I was shocked because there was no one offering support. So my right arm accomplished deliverance. My raging anger drove me on, and I trampled nations in my anger, and I made them drunk in my rage. I splashed their blood on the ground. Or, as it says in Joel 3, starting in verse 13, put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. 
Come tread the grapes, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. The sun and moon have become dark, and the stars have lost their brightness. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth quake, but the Lord is a refuge for his people and a stronghold for the sons of Israel. Then you will know that I'm the Lord your God, dwelling on Zion, my holy mountain, so Jerusalem will be holy and strangers will no longer pass through it. We have a harvest scene being drawn here of a crop that is over ready for harvest to the point that it, it, it's just, it may be too late. This same scene is repeated for us in the book of Revelation. Revelation's pointing to Joel. Joel is a precursor of what we see in Revelation. This is all judgment. That's what this is pointing to. It is clear that the scenes of this in Revelation come from Joel. They come from this prophecy. And they describe the accomplishment of the events just as they are foretold by Joel. We learn, therefore, the time, the connection, and the object of these judgments. The time is the day of the Lord. It's the first seven days. It's the beginning of the day of the Lord, the first seven years. The period when he judges the Gentiles and restores Israel, and that's taking place now, as at the point where we are in Joel. Here, therefore, we see Israel is the center of his purpose, Jerusalem the center of his interests, and his government will be in Zion. That's where he will be. In fact, Yahweh tells us in the book of Ezekiel he will actually live in the temple and dwell with his people during the entire millennium. The Gentiles who have long oppressed Israel, and they still do today, are gathered for judgment. And the power and the glory of Yahweh are manifested on the side of his people, and they come forth from his city. God's permitted the Gentiles to have their day. And the past to which they've brought things to, they've made a problem. They've made, a, they've made the whole thing into a blasphemy because now they've turned to following Satan. They have made this world leader, the beast, into a false Christ. They, it's just, it's ridiculous what they've done. So the harvest is ripe. We see it in Revelation 14, same picture, same image, same, same, and in fact, John's pointing back to Joel. Then I looked, and a white cloud appeared, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man. And anytime you see that in the Bible where there's one riding on the cloud, that's God, okay? It's always God, always, always, always God. He had a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple shouting in a loud voice to the one seated on the cloud, use your sickle and start to reap because the time to reap has come since the earth's harvest is ripe. So the one seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was reaped. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven and he too had a sharp sickle. Another angel who was in charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice, to the angel who had the sharp sickle, use your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes off the vine of the earth because its grapes are now ripe. So the angel swung his sickle over the earth and gathered the grapes from the vineyard of the earth and tossed them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Then the winepress was stomped outside the city and blood poured out of the winepress, the height of horses' bridles for a distance of around 200 miles. The imagery shows us that the Lord has his sickle in his hand. He's ready to reap. That's what you use to reap wheat. And it's at this point an angel comes out of the temple to let him know, hey, it's time. The hour has arrived. It's not a command. It's an announcement from the angel saying the time's arrived. Note the condition of the harvest. It's overly ripe. It's ready. Another angel shows up with a sickle to ensure that everybody who's supposed to be there is there. The word translated ripe, again, is the Greek word exoranthe. It says to be dry to the point of being paralyzed. It's overly dry. It's overly ripe. It's, it's wheat, overly ready to be harvested. The idea, again, just like we see in Joel, is something is overripe, which means that God doesn't judge the earth until it's not only ready for judgment, it's overly ready for judgment. He's not rushing into it. 
for Joel, he began talking about how the locusts destroyed the crops of Judah as a type of the day of the Lord. And now he comes back to the same image as the Lord begins judging the nations of the world. They're ripe. It's almost past time for harvest. Just the right vintage to be fully harvested. It's verse 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. All the armies of the world have been drawn to this one location. And we get a picture of them in their military splendor coming to a central location where initially they are engaging in combat with each other, but the prophet viewed many multitudes in this valley. And now he says it's the valley of decision. Why? Because God the judge is making a decision about their fate right there in that valley. The day of the Lord was near from his perspective. Of course, it hasn't happened yet. Joel told us this 2,600 years ago. But the prophets always say it's, it's near, it's about to happen. They, they always see it occurring almost immediately. Even as these armies enter into the valley to engage, each person, each individual in that army is responsible for their own decisions and for the fact that they're there. Yes, they've been drawn there supernaturally, but they could have said no. They could have stayed home. They didn't have to have to be there. They could turn and leave, but it, by the fact that you've got other armies guarding the exterior of the, of the battlefield tells you that eh, maybe they don't. We've already seen what happens to those who are engaged in the attack on Jerusalem. We know the armies are going to turn on each other because they're going to try and kill each other because they don't know where they're shooting. It's going to get dark. A more appropriate translation, though, based on the Hebrew here, is not multitudes, multitudes, but it's mobs of people in the valley of verdict. There's no opportunity for salvation here. There's, if you're in that valley, you're having a bad day. That's just the way it's going to be. There's no hope. Anybody who's there, there's no hope. It's judgment. That's all it is. The word here used in the Hebrew is hamonim, and it means horde, or a huge multitude, or I like the word mob. I really like that. Uh, in other words, if you go with this army and you enter this valley, doom. That's all there is, is doom. Scripture, though, is also conclusive because we see an army that, he call, that the Lord calls down, and Joel talks about it, but the scripture is very clear that there's only one person engaged in combat operations, Jesus Christ. There's nobody else engaged. We know this from what we've seen in Isaiah 63, 1, and in Revelation 19, 11 to 16. We also know that the sword that he uses comes from his mouth. It's his word. It's what he says. It's what he speaks. The plague that we read about in Zechariah 14 sounds like something's happening to this army and, and it's happening at a cellular or atomic level. They're just falling apart. I mean, when you first look at it, it almost looks like the use of a neutron bomb, but when you look at the fact of what we're going to see here in, in the scriptures, it just could be Jesus saying, I'm not going to hold you together anymore. What is it that Jesus says or does that could have that kind of impact? Simple. He's the creator. He holds everything together. This means he can also stop holding things together. We really do not know what the case is, but we do get hints from the scripture. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20, we read this about the Lord. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, invisible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. God, Christ made it all. What that means is that when Satan is tempting Jesus, he's tempting the one that actually created him, and he knows it. He is before all things. Well, see, all things were created through him and for him. So Christ made everything. 
And he is before all things. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. Jesus is the nuclear glue that holds the atom together. Physicists are trying to figure out today what holds that thing together. That's why they've got this giant cyclotron out there in, in Europe where they're trying to break, break, break into the atom and find out, well, Jesus is the one who holds it together. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his Christ. He's the nuclear glue. It could be that simply Jesus just says, I'm not going to hold you together anymore. They could be learning about the truth that it says in Colossians 1 in real time on the battlefield. We don't know. But when you start reading the different scriptures, that's a logical explanation. How Jesus judges the nations is something we will see firsthand. Since we as believers are part of that army coming with him, referenced in Revelation 19. He just does it all. The valley of decision is a picture of his wrath. And by the time you get here, the metaphor of warfare is almost gone. It, it, it's, it's now judgment. It's, it's execution of judgment. There are two pictures in this chapter. One of the sheep and goats judgment with all mankind who's left at the end of the tribulation in a valley and Jesus is seated in judgment. We talked about that last week. That's Joel chapter 3 verses 1 to 8. But there's also the picture of him seated in judgment prior to that. When he returns as the avenger of blood on behalf of his people as he rescues them at Armageddon. That's Joel chapter 3, 9 to 17. When Jesus says the word and the plague comes upon them, as Zechariah says, the scripture is very clear. The blood will flow at the height of a bridle of a horse about five feet high for a distance of 200 miles all around. It's just like all the bodies just suddenly cease being held together all at once. Joel, though, he hears the battle, and he gives us some background, but he doesn't give us any detail. And it's, it's interesting. Joel, you're there. You're seeing this. What's going on? Well, he gives us the roar and the thunder of the battle, but he doesn't tell us about the fighting because he says there's a heavy cloud hung over the valley, shutting out the view. There's a lack of detail. There's a lack of definiteness, which creates a feeling of vagueness. You know, I, what's going on? Could it be that Joel doesn't want to write about it? It's so horrid he doesn't want to write about it? Or is he just... The holiness of God has so overwhelmed him that he just he can't write about it. We don't know. He doesn't describe the battle between the heavenly and the earthly armies here. He just doesn't. Verse 15, the sun and moon have become dark, and the stars have lost their brightness. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth quake. But the Lord is a refuge for his people and a stronghold for the sons of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God, dwelling on Zion, my holy mountain. So Jerusalem will be holy, and strangers will no longer pass through it. All of creation has reacted to the day of the Lord. Those who worship darkness get what they wanted, darkness. God, though, is maintaining protection for his people. Because he came back for them. They asked him to come back, and he did so. Just as he did at the beginning of Joel, where he, they, he asked for, they repented, and, and, they, and he protects them. This is seen in the bold judgments in Revelation 16, 10, reiterated here by Joel and later by Isaiah in chapter 13 and in chapter 24. The darkness is what I'm talking about. And in verse 16, we see the Lord roars from Zion. Well, of course, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's a good picture. It's a good image right there. We hear his intervention, actually, on behalf of his people. That's what that roaring is. We'll see it again in Amos chapter 1, verse 2, when we get there. Because he'll roar again in Amos as well. The voice which spoke the universe into existence at creation 
has the power to shake that creation up, just like he used the locusts to do earlier in chapter 2. In judgment and restoration, he can use whatever tools he wants, he can use whatever creatures he wants, or he can do it himself. The context suggests that the divine lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, is roaring words of assurance to his own people, saying, I've got this, don't worry about it, and at the same time, taking out the enemy. And he only takes words. That's the only weapon he has, remember? That's what it says in Revelation 19, the sword from his mouth. And as horrid as the conditions are for those being judged and for his people, he's still a refuge, and he's a stronghold, and now he's protecting his people. And before everything goes dark, they see one thing. Everything's dark, everything's black, and all of a sudden they hear a noise, they look up and they see a bright light. And John tells it this way in verse 11 of chapter 19, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and the one sitting on it called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flaming fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. In other words, his word. And he'll rule them with a rod of iron, and he'll tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Everything goes dark, and the only light that the armies of the world have is the light of Jesus showing up in the clouds of the sky. That's all they see, and this massive army behind him. For those being judged, they were in darkness, and in this bright light, now they can't see anything. But they know they need to get rid of whatever that is coming, so they start trying to engage targets that they can't see because their eyesight has just been destroyed by this bright light. They're staggering, and they're groping around in the dark, trying to acquire targets and trying to desperately destroy them. And I'm reminded of what the psalmist says in Psalm 2, starting in verse 4, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision, and he'll speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. They're killing each other because they're trying to, they don't know what they're shooting. They can't hit their intended target. And above the noise and the screams, they hear a sound louder than any of the noises and sounds of the battlefield. And it's a sound that strikes fear in their hearts. That sound is the roar of the lion of the tribe of Judah, the king in judgment, and it's the last thing they will ever hear in this life. Amos 1 verse 2 says this, he said the Lord roars from Zion, and from Jerusalem he utters his voice, and the shepherd's pasture grounds mourn, and the summit of Carmel dries up. There's terror on the battlefield. Millions who have been, isn't it nice of the Lord to bring the, the, uh, the, the stuff with it to kind of enhance this? There's terror on the battlefield. Millions who had gathered to fight each other, they're now fighting God. And suddenly, with a word, they're gone. They're just gone. All that is left now is animal food for all the carrion birds that have been gathered there. And it's just silent. The reversal that takes place is just as stunning as the reversal from the locusts that we talked about earlier in chapter 2. And the sun actually shines now. It says that in verse 17 of Revelation 19. I saw an angel standing in the sun. Huh? I mean, now the sun is shining just like that? And with a loud voice, he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead. Come, gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. 
In other words, it's a good day to be a vulture. That's what the Lord has them called there to do. With the same suddenness of reversal that was experienced by Judah when they repented and Yahweh restored them from the locust invasion, and we talked about that, the threat's gone. The beast and his forces are gone. Messiah has come. And by the way, all of his people are now filled with the Holy Spirit. They've never been filled with the Holy Spirit before. This is all brand new to them. They don't understand why they're not scared out of their minds. They're not because they're all filled with the Spirit, because Messiah showed up. Verse 17, he says this, Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling on Zion, my holy mountain. So Jerusalem will be holy, and strangers will no longer pass through it. So as the noise downs, dies down in the battlefield, what you hear instead are praises of joy from those that Messiah has just rescued, and praises coming from the army, us, as we descend with him. He will be known by his people as the Lord, their God, the one who saves them. He will once again inhabit Zion. He left. Ezekiel talks about the spirit leaving prior to the, in, the final invasion by Babylon. Well, now he's back. Hasn't been back in 2,000 years. He left uh, going out the east gate, and heading over to the Mount, uh, Mount of, uh, of Olives at that point. Well, now he's coming back, and he's going back to the same way he left. And now Jerusalem's untouchable. Now, for years, for centuries, Jews have thought that it's because of Jerusalem that they were untouchable. That, oh, it was because Jerusalem. That, that's why God won't let us be destroyed. They got destroyed more than once. But now, God himself will be there. There won't be any unbelievers walking through that town anymore. At all. It's now holy because Yahweh will be there Jesus will have his throne there. And that's where the center of the world will be ruled. Jerusalem was set apart by Yahweh, and his, and he, his intent is to dwell there with his people. And because he dwells with them, it will be holy. No unbeliever can ever go through that city. I mean, we see that written for us in Revelation 21, 27, but... Once the millennium starts, that's, that's the case. I mean, God's there, and, and there will no longer be unbelievers going into Jerusalem. It just won't happen. It can't happen. For the nations, Yahweh's presence on Mount Zion, in conjunction with the cosmic display of power and the roaring of his voice from Jerusalem, well, it generates fear and panic before they all disappear. The judge of all the earth has taken up residence and now is dispensing righteous judgment upon those who are unrighteous, on those who have offended his people, who have imprisoned his people, who have killed his people. It's over with. But for his people, the sound of his voice is totally different. His presence and the sound of his voice is assurance and protection because we love him. We want to be with him. Verse 18, on that day the mountains will drip with sweet wine and the hills will flow with milk and all the brooks of Judah will flow with water and a spring will go out from the house of the Lord and water the valley of Shittim. Egypt will become a wasteland, and Edom will become a desolate wilderness because of the violence done to the sons of Judah in whose land they have shed innocent blood. But Judah will be inhabited forever, and Jerusalem for all generations. And I will avenge their blood, which I have not avenged, for the Lord dwells in Zion. The restoration being promised by the Lord here is absolutely staggering. The planet has been devastated by the earth dwellers. They thought they could, once they finally get rid of all those Christians, they thought they could finally rule the world they want to. And they destroyed it. And then you've had God's judgments poured out on top of, on top of that as well. 
his people have responded the way they responded earlier in Joel. They repented. They looked to him to restore them from the loss of everything. And now it's the loss of everything. They're at the same place that they were at the beginning of chapter 2. They're in that place now at the end of Armageddon. Just as he did in the past, those in Jerusalem visibly begin to see the formerly destroyed surroundings of the city starting to turn green. The sun's come up. I wouldn't be surprised that as the sun comes up and the armies are gone, you start to see the, the grass beginning to grow and, and the crops starting to, to grow. The, the climate is suddenly changing. God's intent was to make earth like Eden, and he starts doing that immediately. Abundance becomes the word. Why? God's a promise-keeping God. He saved his people by direct intervention. He removed the usurpers from the land, did a little better job than Joshua did. He got rid of all of them. He has restored the land above and beyond anyone's wildest dreams. He predicts that the environment where God's future people will live here, that's what Joel's saying, will be a, an environment of super abundant fertility. I mean, the only way that Joel can talk about it is it makes it sound like the hills just pour wine from them. It's just, it, it, it's just that abundant. Super abundance. And on top of that, all the streams have water in them. Even during the really heavy rains that they've had in Israel the last two years, most of the streams have run, but not all of them. Some of them still only run when there's rain, and then they don't run. Those are normally called wadis. They're down in the south. All of them will be running all the time because it's going to be green. It's going to be raining. It's going to be, they, they'll have exactly what they need to have. No more drought, no more disease, no more insects, no more wars, no more enemy armies, no more economic ruin. The soil is now fertile. The harvest is enormous. The prosperity will flow throughout the entire nation. And so, in fact, it's going to be so prosperous that literally the mountains will be dripping with new wine and the hills will be flowing with milk. That's how prosperous they'll be. The land of Israel will finally be the land that flows with milk and honey. And in addition to that, the water supply is now endless. It will never end. The last half of verse 18 says, A spring will go out from the house of the Lord and water the valley of Sitham. That's a new water source. Other prophets expand on this water source. Imagine water gushing out from the temple where Yahweh resides. A physical sign of what is happening spiritually for all. The Holy Spirit fills everyone post sheep and goats judgment. There's no shortage of water. There's no shortage of the Holy Spirit. None. Zechariah gives us a hint of this in Zechariah 14.8, but Ezekiel is the one that has to explain it to us. In Zechariah 14.8, it says that on that day, living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem. Notice the term that Zechariah uses, living waters. Why is he calling them living waters? Well, Jesus picks up on that term also talking to the woman of the well, We're talking about living water that he supplies. Half to the eastern sea and half to the western sea. It'll continue in summer as in winter. Zechariah calls them living waters. It's physical, but it's also a fulfilled promise, which is available today to those who follow Christ. It's, again, it's an already but not yet thing. Not everyone has the Holy Spirit, but just those who have trusted in Jesus Christ do. John 7, 38 says... Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. That's the water we're talking about, of the Spirit. Now, Ezekiel gives us a little more detail about it. Apparently, God wanted him to fully understand what Joel's talking about. So here's what we see in Ezekiel 47, starting in verse 1. In my vision, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple. And there I saw a stream flowing east from beneath the door of the temple and passing to the right of the altar on its south side. So it's a stream. You can step over it. The man brought me outside the wall through the north gateway and led me around to the eastern entrance. So it's coming underneath the door, 
passing to the right of the altar on the south side. And I could see the water flowing out through the south side of the east gateway. So as you look at it, it's on the right side of the east. You know, you're looking to the east, and it's on the, the south side of it. So it's on the right-hand side as he's looking out. Measuring as he went, he took me along the stream for about 1,750 feet, and then led me across. The water was up to my ankles. He measured off another 1,750 feet, a quarter mile or so, and led me across again. Now it's up to my knees. Then another quarter mile or so, 1,750 feet, and it's up to my waist. Then he measured another 1,750 feet, and the river was too deep to walk across. In less than a mile from the temple to where he's, he can't walk across it anymore. It's too deep. It was a deep enough to swim in, but too deep to walk through. He asked me, have you been watching, son of man, and led me back along the riverbank? And when I returned, I was surprised by the sight of many trees growing on both sides of this river. And he said to me, this river flows east through the desert into the valley of the Dead Sea. The waters of the stream will make the salty waters of the Dead Sea fresh and pure. And there'll be swarms of living things wherever the water of this river flows. Living water. Fish will abound in the Dead Sea, for its waters will become fresh. Life will flourish wherever this water flows. Fishermen will stand along the shores of the Dead Sea, all the way from En Gedi to En Agelum. Right now, that's desert. There's nothing there. The shores will be covered with nets drying in the sun. Fish of every kind will fill the Dead Sea just as they fill the Mediterranean. But the swamps and marshes, they'll not be purified, they'll still be salty. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow along both sides of the river. The leaves of these trees will never turn brown and fall, and there'll always be fruit on their branches. There'll be a new crop every month. For they're watered by the river flowing from the temple, and the fruit will be for food, and the leaves for healing. So all you need is a couple of leaves off those trees, and it takes care of any problem you have. Isaiah gives us a picture of this day as well in Isaiah 44. I'll pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I'll pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They shall spring up among the grass like willows by flowing streams. This one will say, I'm the Lord's. And another one will call on the name of Jacob, and another will write on his hand, the Lord's, and name himself by the name of Israel. Verse 19, Egypt will become a wasteland. Edom will become a desolate wilderness because of the violence done to the sons of Judah in whose land they have shed innocent blood. Just as the Lord is fulfilling his promises to his people and bringing prosperity, he reminds them again that he is a promise-keeping God. And he brings up two nations that cursed him. Essential to this message for salvation is the fact that God has avenged innocent blood, which Edom and Egypt shed in Judah. Because the enemies of his people have been dealt with by God, never to be a problem again, the nation can now enjoy the fullness of life that flows from the temple, and they never have to leave. Verses 20 and 21 tells us that Judah will be inhabited forever, and Jerusalem for all generations. There'll be a new Jerusalem, and it'll come down from heaven, but they're still going to be in Judah, and it'll be inhabited forever. I will avenge their blood, which I have not avenged, for the Lord dwells in Zion. The promise of restoration, ultimate restoration, is now stated clearly by the Lord. And once they're fully restored, they never leave. And there's also a promise that for those who abuse Israel in the past, in the present, or in the future from when Joel's talking, they, they have a future too. When Jesus returns, he returns as the avenger of blood. The promise is sobering. The eternal desolation of world kingdoms mentioned here will wipe out all the wrong which they have done to the people of God and which has remained unpunished up to that point. But Zion will rejoice in the eternal reign of God. Yahweh will dwell upon Zion as we see in Ezekiel when he manifests himself to all the world as the king of his people. On one hand, it's manifested when he finally takes care of all the enemies. And on the other, when he takes over and perfects his glory in the kingdom. Joel began with judgment and an appeal to repent and return in order to experience restoration. 
when he restores, he goes beyond anything we could ever dream of, even recovering lost years for us by providing overwhelming blessings in the current day. The prom that promise is amazing, but then when you add the outpouring of his Holy Spirit on all flesh, you can't believe it. Once the Spirit's been poured out, the way is clear for the arrival of the final day of judgment, the last manifestation of the day of the Lord. Actually, there's more yet to come. There's some, the, that author believes it, it, it ends at that point. On that day, the wicked will be utterly destroyed, the great white throne judgment, and the wicked will be utterly destroyed, and the righteous will stand vindicated forever in his presence. And this is a warning to the nations of the earth, and it has to be heeded, but it's also a promise to those of us who love the Lord. So if you don't know the Lord, join us. Be part of the group that will be standing together with his people in that day, returning, as we've learned, as part of the heavenly host. If you like horses, if you like wearing white, that's the place to be, because that's, that's what we're going to be doing. He's a promise-keeping God. He likes to keep his promise. He makes promises and then goes out of his way to achieve them for us. His promise of salvation is for whoever listens and takes action on the offer he's presented to us through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As it says in Romans chapter 10, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it's by believing in your heart that you're made right with God and it'll be openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jews and Gentiles are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's simple. A, acknowledge you're a sinner and tell him that. B, believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sin and that he rose from the dead. And C, confess that Jesus is Lord. Tell somebody about what you've done. Tell us if, if that's what you've done. We'd love to hear it. That takes us to the end of the book of Joel. It's all about the day of the Lord. It gets kind of draggy a little bit, but not like we're going to see in other places. So next time, we're going to start the book of Amos. Again, it's only nine chapters. And it's all about Israel. Now the judgment is on Israel. And Amos is an interesting guy. He's a country boy. And we'll learn more about him next week. Let's pray. Lord, we, th we love you, and we thank you for giving us the book of Joel and explaining to us so completely what you intend to do at the end of the age, for giving us information here that we can read more about in the book of Revelation. Lord, we thank you for the fact that because of what you did on the cross for us, Jesus, we don't have to go through any of that, that you're saving us from that and that we're going to be with you while that's all happening here on this planet. Lord, help us to be mindful of that and to be telling others about you and the salvation that you provide. Lord, again, we pray that if there's anybody listening or watching, that they take advantage of the promise that you've made to save if they only acknowledge that they're sinners, that you died on the cross and rose from the dead, and you ask them to make them the Lord of their life, that you'll save them. Lord, we'd love to see more come to know you, and we'd love to be able to take others with us when you call us home to be with you, which we believe is going to be happening very, very soon. Thank you now, Lord, for this, your word. Thank you for this book and the time together that you've given.